Ajua Bupuka is missing a toe. She's receiving treatment after being knocked down while hawking on the street in Kumase. She's been here at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital for several weeks. <laughs> I was hawking water on the street at Santase Runabout. I heard people shouting, and before I realized, I had been knocked down by a car. That's all I can remember. I am told I lost my toe when I was being pulled from under the vehicle. The doctor says I need to have a surgery, else I wouldn't be able to use my legs. Thirty-three-year-old Yasewa is also nursing severe wounds at her back and around her stomach. The mother of four was trapped under a vehicle when a loaded tricycle she was traveling in collided with a minivan at Bonre Ebra in the Ashanti region. She had her eight-month-old baby with her when the accident occurred. <laughs> We were close to our destination when the accident occurred. I have no idea how it happened. My sister, with whom I was traveling, said the oncoming vehicle veered into our lane. My baby and I ended up under the vehicle after it crashed into our tricycle. My sister raised an alarm that I was missing. They searched under the vehicle and found my arm that was sticking out. Then they pushed the vehicle and rescued us. My baby's leg broke. They thought both of us had died. Apart from the wounds at my back, I broke some bones in my leg. Both women feel lucky to be alive, but are worried about how their children are faring while they are on admission. Each woman has four children, all under age 10. My baby is not allowed inside the ward because he may catch an infection, so I've had to stop breastfeeding. I have no idea what my children are doing while I'm in the hospital. I'm a farmer. That's how I'm able to support my family. What am I supposed to do now in this condition? How will I feed my children? I can only trust God to help me through these challenging times.
I have sleepless nights. I'm in so much pain and I can't turn. I'm always thinking about my condition and my children. Who will care for them? They are all alone. I am very worried. These are just a few of the cases Dr. Tivo and his team at the Trauma and Orthopedic Department manage every day. He says many of the patients the center receives are road accident victims. About 80% of patients who come with injury are as a result of accidents, uh, road traffic accidents in one form or the other. And, um, uh, this center is a number one trauma center where we see a lot of accident cases across the country. In a day, we see on average about 10 to 15 of accident victims. And out of these, um, about eight of them come in critical conditions. Who, uh, and these patients need one to be stabilized first to save their life. And then the next... Uh, um, um, uh, thing is for them to be prepared for surgery to save the injured limb as well. As the major referral facility serving the northern part of the country, the Trauma and Orthopedic Department of the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital is usually overwhelmed with the number of serious injuries they have to attend to. Dr. Tivo is particularly concerned about how first responders handle accident victims before they are transported to the hospital. Our performance review for 2017, we have 50, 50 people brought in dead as a result of road traffic accidents. And the causes of this might be because our uh, emergency response system is weak our emergency response uh, uh, system needs to be strengthened. The first thing is, when they are at the site of the injury, how do these patients, how long does it take these patients to get to the treatment centers? It's a huge problem. We, ambulances are not working. The, the, uh, the ambulances we have are all broken down. The whole Ashanti region, we have about one or two ambulances working. So you can imagine accidents happening anywhere and patient needs to be transported. They have to be transported in uh, uh, taxis, in private vehicles and so forth. Getting the patients to the treatment center is a key uh, 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 issue for us. We don't have that means. And most of the patients end up dying at the scenes of the accidents or along the way. We don't have enough people trained at various accident prone areas or as they improve roads, so that when anything like that happens, they can be called upon immediately to make sure that at the site of the injury or at the site of the accident, they put in measures to save life of, uh, of accident victims. We lack such people. We lack such training. And we think resources should be channeled towards emergency responses as far as road, and, uh, road traffic accidents is concerned. If we have to save life, then we need to improve, procure more equipment. We don't have monitors to monitor the vital signs of patients so that even if their condition is changing, the machines can be able to tell us that so so and so is happening. So this action needs to be taken. We lack those machines. Some are there, they are not working. They are overaged and they need to be replaced. We don't have ventilators such that when a patient is not able to breathe as a result of road traffic accidents, the machine will breathe for the patient while we make attempt to correct other abnormalities that is in the system to bring the patient back to life. For the whole confinement, the intensive care unit, we have only one. So if some one person uses that machine and another, other patients who need that machine come, that means that uh, we are going to be looking at them and they die off. So these are the situations we have. So averagely, in the intensive care unit, we need about 10 ventilators. But as I'm speaking now, we have only one. Gabiadu Jemfi is a road safety campaigner. 
For the past five years, he's been traveling across the country, preaching road safety messages to people. His near-death experience 15 years ago fuels this passion. It was a miracle he opened his eyes at the right moment, just when his body was to be loaded into a fridge at the morgue. I found myself uh, in the mortuary on top of two women, one head up, one head down, and the mortuary man lifted the stretcher. I was tagged with the mug number C22, tagged on my neck, my wrist, and my leg. And um, I was having a towel, white towel on my waist. According to the hospital, I was injected with the formalin, which um, they about to put me inside the fridge, then I came back to life. Even when I survived, um, the much remind thought maybe a spirit has just uh, come before me. So, according to him, he said, uh, upon the chemicals that they injected me, there's no way to survive. So either I like it or not, he will still put me inside the fridge. So I jumped from the stretcher and I landed on the floor. So when I landed, I've, I landed on my fingers. Then it turned my finger like this. I came back to life around 9.45 a.m. Sunday. Uh, and um, sorry, Monday. And they kept me at the theater gate like from 10 a.m. to the next day because no money. And the pain that I'd been to living that time, I was crying to die. The ghastly accident in 2003 badly injured Gabby's right hand. Though the wounds have healed, you still see a huge scar where the flesh had come off. I was a student by then at St. Joseph Senior High Technical School at Antibekwai Ehwene. My mom was a single parent, so she was supporting me and uh, I was owing from the school, so I need to come and do something to get money to pay my fees. And uh, when we vacated, I tried to sell pure water, Desta, Henky, Piki. It couldn't help, so two weeks for our school to reopen, then I went to a driver and I begged him that I want to be his mate or his uh, conductor to get money to pay my fees. So he accepted me and uh, first day, second day, the fourth day, then the car involved in an accident at Sewa Junction in Kumasi. The cars are assaulted and like um, it threw me on the road like um, 150 to 200 meters. So I fell on the road while the car was just th uh, throwing me on the road. So I found my hand, um, all um, the flesh removed. The big bone also became small and the small bones all got broke. At first, I didn't know what has happened to me. But after like, I wake up, then I felt the pain from my face, my hand, my chest, my breast, got my breast all cut out. So I felt the pain. Then I got to know that something has happened to me. According to Asuka police, Kumasi, the woman who caused the accident, she was on phone using a pickup with tough speed and she made wrong full overtaking instead of left side he made it on the right side with a tough speed so her car came and hit our car whilst we were climbing um uh, how do you call it we, we were climbing a hill yeah hill so the other car too was coming from sewa Janshi. so when after she hit our car our car too hit the other car then all the cars are sorted so the cause of the accident was wrongful overtaking. We were 32 persons on board for the three vehicles. And out of the 32 persons on board, as of now, I'm the only survivor.
When major road crashes occur, citizens weigh in on what could have been the cause of the tragedy. Driver error, speeding, wrongful overtaking and poor state of the roads feature prominently in the discourse. For me, I've been meeting accidents on the road so many times. It was God. One time I was traveling to Cape Coast, hey, Tibaka, hit our truck, our bus, on their back. God help us. One o'clock we were suffering on the road. Why? Because there was a lot of potholes. When it was just diverting, oh, why that we pay road tolls, we pay for roadworthy, and our roads are not roadworthiness. So where is the money, the money that we pay? So sometimes I get mad. And if I look at the way people are dying, my dear, for the past 20 years, uh, the death uh, ratio in accident for the country is more than the population in the central region. During recent working trips across the country, I witnessed firsthand how dangerously drivers of buses, heavy duty trucks, and even saloon cars overtake other vehicles on the highway. There were several instances where drivers of commercial buses and cargo trucks start to overtake other vehicles even though the road ahead is not clear and not the right moment for such a move. But they are disappointing Ghana. But to Reverend Emmanuel Edusei Dapa, who's had to bury a child and a grandchild killed in a road accident, it's unacceptable that major highways linking cities and towns across the country still remain single lanes. This accident shouldn't have happened at all in the first place. If the roads are up to date, we are in a modern world. Why should a country like Ghana? From our main road, one main road, connecting the two largest cities, be just a single lane. Articulate heavy trust, all passing one through. It's, it's very unfortunate. Our leaders must live up to expectation. No civilized country. You go to America and see this. No. Even Nigeria, even in Ivory Coast, you go, you don't see these things. People dying through road, roads, small, small. No. Our roads are too tiny. In those days, when we were, going, we were going to Accra, you go and go and go before you see one car. Shum, about 40 years ago. Yes. But today, the population is increased. Cars are many. The same road. The same road. And our people, government, are doing nothing about it. And people hear the accident all the time dying. Then they blame the drivers. But the government has also his part to play. Nightfall comes like a dreaded disease, seeping through the pores of a healthy body and ravaging it beyond repair. In the first stanza of Oswald Charlie's famous poem, Nightfall in Soweto, he succinctly captures the fear that the night brings in Soweto, South Africa, during colonialism due to heinous crimes. In Ghana, Traveling at night is probably as scary as the dreaded situation in Soweto during oppressed South Africa, as described by Charlie in his poem, poorly lit highways, reduced visibility, inadequate warnings of dangers ahead, as well as poor decisions taken by drivers hardly make road trips at night fun. Accidents that have occurred at night have often been ghastly, claiming many lives. Even the presidential convoy was not spared. A driver of an articulated truck was said to have ignored all warnings to stop and ended up running into the presidential convoy in the early hours of Friday, May 18. Deputy Chief of Staff Francis Asenso Boache had a lucky escape when the Toyota V8 car he was traveling in was crushed by the truck in Konongo in the Ashanti region. 
According to Communications Director of the Presidency, Eugene Ahin, President Ekufuado, who was in the convoy, was not affected. He went on to safely complete his working tour of the Bono Ahafo region. We were on our way to Kumasi when the incident happened. So yes, the president was part of the convoy when it happened. His vehicle was well uh, uh, ahead and then the rest of us are also uh, back there. So with regards to what happened to the deputy chief of staff, it's now a little bit understandable how sometimes some of these accidents happen, especially at that time of the night. Most of these articulated vehicles, unfortunately, plied these roads without any regard for oncoming vehicles. It's a situation we'd have to address because it looks like the lawlessness on the roads, I mean, especially at that time of the night. On our way to Kumasi to film some interviews, night fell. Long stretches of the Accra Kumasi Highway remained dark without street lights. We drove on, depending solely on light from our vehicle for visibility. It often got scary and dangerous when heavy trucks approaching from the opposite direction had their highlights on, blinding us. According to provisional figures from the Motor Traffic and Transport Department, 2,076 people were killed in road accidents in 2017. Many of them were young people who were part of the country's workforce, but their lives tragically ended, robbing the nation of some of the finest brains and hardworking men and women who would have contributed to national development. It's very, very, very painful to see your loved ones, doctors, journalists, big men dying such deaths on our road. And our government, when they are coming, say, everybody stop. You don't want a collision. So if you know that our roads are safe, why do you say everybody should stop for you to come? Why do you take the aeroplane? So this means that they, these people, to me, they are not living up to We are in a modern world, they should modernize Ghana. Uh, doctors are dying. This accident which came, Burgers in it died. People who had come from abroad. Central internal revenue people were there. Head madams were there. Important, important people were in the bus and they died. People's fathers, people's mothers, uncles who were looking after people, they have died. And the government is, is infernal. From the WHO uh, reports, about 25% of the accident victims are children. Children. And um, Oh, close to 50% of them are um, um, the youth. When I say the youth, people less than 40 years. And that's the working force for our countries, especially the developing countries. So if more than 50% of road traffic accidents are, going, uh, are the youth who are supposed to be, be in their pro, uh, pro, uh, productive years, they means the economic laws that, that that should tell us the economic laws countries will be having countries with high incidence of road traffic accidents will be having so really it is not only to in the individual a loss to the individual and the family but also to the countries and the world as la at large provisional figures from the motor traffic and transport department also show that more than 12,000 people sustained injuries in road traffic accidents last year. Dr. Vincent Ativo says some of the most serious injuries leave survivors of road accidents less capable of being as productive as they were before, a major economic loss to the victims' families as well as the nation. More than 80% of the accident victims who come here are the youth. Are people, active people who uh, will be, should be working to, 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 to generate revenue for our, our, our nation, but they get injured. And I must say that the economic loss to their, themselves, their families, their dependents, and the nation is very huge. Only we are not able to quantify that economic loss. And I think if we really put a lot more into research, to see the economic law and take drastic action and make sure that we, we bring out laws to protect ourselves on the road and curb road traffic accidents. That would be a better agenda for us to pursue. These are preventable deaths and we could do, we could, we could do more as a nation um, to, to strengthen our health systems and make sure that 
we are well protected on our roads and also taking good care of accident victims when it does happen. green grass and flowers. I should be working by now, but I haven't been able to earn any money since the accident. The little money I have saved has gone into treatment. Besides, I haven't received any support from the driver who caused the accident. He asked me to deal with the insurance company, but I have no idea how I'm supposed to do that. Ben, it's as much as you can again. As much as you can. Besides, the healing process for survivors can be long, slow, painful and costly. Exactly how long a fracture would take will depend on the damage given to the bone, it will depend on the repair that was done, it will depend on when physio or rehabilitation was started, it will depend on the patient's response. So averagely, we can say that looking at how bones heal, depending on what was done, how it was done, bones could heal averagely by six weeks. So within six weeks, we could say that the patient can start doing mobilization, which is actually stepping on the fractured leg or thigh bone. Or if it's the hand, yes, using the hand to do light activities. Let's say you break your leg bone, which has two, the smaller fibula, the bigger one, the tibia. If you break your fibula, of course, by six weeks with good management, we should have a bit of progress in you being able to walk with an assistive device. But if you break the tibula, depending on where you broke it and the type of fracture that you had, then we, couldn't, we can't just say that within six weeks you can. No, within six weeks you may be able to, to sit or to transfer from the bed to a wheelchair to a, a normal sitting chair, and then you might be able to do standing. But for walking, no. With tibia fractures, you might walk, but you walk on the unaffected leg, especially those with the fracture to the pelvic area or the hip bone area. It's very complex for them. Others too who have had injuries affecting the spine is also very delicate and difficult to treat and it's really rehab is prolonged. So it's all quite patient specific and then injury specific. Mm -hmm.